The following presentation was recorded live. Viewer discretion is advised. Um, this is Dr. Richard Dutro, otherwise known as Dick. He was born in Zanesville, Ohio, so Ohio born and bred. He attended St. Thomas School and graduated from there. He entered the service at age 19, 18. excuse me, at 18, in 1944. And after the service, he entered the University of Dayton and he received his master's from Miami U and his PhD at Ohio State. So you did leave Ohio for a little bit, huh? <laughs> no, where, where'd I go? <laughs> Overseas. <laughs> so he worked in the Lakewood, Ohio school system for 40 years as a teacher, coordinator of language arts, K through six, and then the curriculum director for K through eight. He's married with three children and still living in the Ohio area and he's taught at Ohio State University and also Baldwin-Wallace University. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Dutro. Those of you who have done any service work anywhere, whether it's with the U.S. government or city, it's a hurry up and wait. Well, today was kind of a hurry up and wait, and when they got it fixed, we got to go. So basically speaking, um, if you are a veteran or have been a veteran or have been in any conflict, my hat goes off to you. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. For the young people, you may have had a brother, a sister, a mom, a dad, an uncle, an aunt, a grandparent, in some service, give them a hug. They deserve it. And I want to be especially open to those veterans who were in the Vietnam War. They never got a chance when they came back. So my hat is off to them. So if you know a veteran from the war, from the Vietnam War, give them an extra hug. Going back to 1939, most of you people were not even born in 1939. My, my mom gathered her four boys together and she said, because in 1939, England and Germany were in war. She said, you boys are going to be in this war. I was in the eighth grade. I said, oh, come on, Mom, we're not going to be in this war. It's between Germany and England. She said, mark my words. My oldest brother was in Africa and Italy during the war. The next brother down was flying off, out of England, bombing cities in Germany. The brother next to me, but a little older, fought in the Japanese sector on New Guinea. And who do you think was the baby of the family? <laughs> We're down to him right now. Uh, I served in Europe, in France, Germany, when war was over in Austria, as we were trying to find other people who had escaped during the previous part of the war. They were up in the Alps Mountains, believe me. Not when the war ended, but two months, three months afterwards, we were still gathering them in. I graduated from high school on a Sunday in June. And on June 6th, as you well know, those of you who know what started our big push in Europe, D-Day, I went up to Fort Hayes and passed my physical. I was 18 years old. I had never picked up a rifle or anything else in my life, even though I lived in what is called now Appalachia area. So they trained me. 
I don't know if they trained me well, but they trained me because they knew they were going to send us over to Europe to replace those poor guys who never made it on D-Day. And that's what I was, a replacement. Went to England, and going across the Atlantic, I always tell the students that I talk with, we go this way across the Atlantic then. And I ask them, why do we zigzag going across the Atlantic? There were 10,000 troops on that USS United States. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes, sir. Beautiful. You see, I'm going back to my teaching. Yep. <laughs> You're absolutely right. The U-boats, they were sinking ships right and left. And when they loved to throw one of those torpedoes or two into a ship full of 10,000 replacements for the war, we landed in England, sat in England because the sea going across between England and France was so rough. And we were on LSTs, and if you know what an LST is, it's like a rowboat out in the Lake Erie. It was up and down and up and down and up and down, so finally it was calm enough that we could go across. We landed in France at La Harve. You have seen recent pictures of the New Jersey coast. That's what La Harve looked like when we landed. Completely flattened. Every building. And La Harve is a pretty big city in France. Then we were dispersed to Nancy, France. A lot of things that happened during the war, you can read about, you can see in the movies, and they overemphasize the whole darn thing, but war is war. But there are funny things that happened too, or strange things that happened. And let me tell you a strange thing that happened to me. I was standing guard duty at Petancourt, France, which is right on the <coughs> Maginot Line, and the Siegfried Line was right behind it. The Maginot was the French, and the Siegfried was the German. And I heard somebody say, hey, Dick, where are you? I said, somebody told me you were down here on guard duty. I said, who in the world, who in the world would know my name? Who do you think it was? You're right, <laughs> my brother. <laughs> he knew where I was because he'd been over there fighting for two and a half years. And he knew my APO number at the Army Post Office Exchange. We spent three days together. When he came home, all of the brothers got together and said, you went A-W-O-L, didn't you? I mean, the war was going on. <laughs> he said, no, A-W-O-L is away without official leave. <laughs> he said, no, I didn't. He said, my sergeant gave me permission. And I thought, sergeants don't really get permission. <laughs> but anyway. We had an enjoyable time. He also came back after the war was over and we spent a week together. We crossed the Rhine River on the big push. The big push for us happened to be on St. Patrick's Day, March 17. We went through the Hartz Mountains, and I'm not going to give you the details because there's only one thing that I will express to the young people and to the your parents or grandparents or all the people who are here. The Germans had a rifle called the 88. It outlasted, it outshot, it out everything that the Americans ever had during World War II. It was tremendous. You could almost hear or see the flash when it exploded. That's how fast and detonating they were. They also had some screaming memes. And they did those just to keep you awake at night. And they would come over in groves of 20, 30, 40, 50 at a time. And if you see a flock of birds flying across the guideline, you can figure if each one of those birds going south 
was a screaming Mimi, you know what it would be, except they'd be really making noise. And so it was a detriment to the people who were in the foxholes sleeping. Another unusual situation during this push before we went across, we had to find our foxholes by following a telephone line. And so there were two or three of us going to a certain hole. And basically speaking, I was first I no more no more telephone line. Well the Germans were only about less than a half mile away from us and we used to go back and forth and back and forth and reconnoiter and do all these kinds of things. I told the guys behind me, I said, I just ran out of the cord. And we all got down on our hands and knees. Somebody said, well, here's a cord. I wonder if it's the same cord. He picked it up and started walking. He said, no, this one is fine. We all got on out and went to our foxhole. So we reported the incident. They said, oh, yeah, the signal cord was here yesterday. They cut some lines and put new ones in. Do you think they would tell you that? <laughs> of course not. Why? They had something to do, so it didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference. So after we crossed the Rhine, we fought in Würzburg, door to door, house to house. What was unusual about Würzburg? Würzburg had something similar to what you might have experienced when you watched New York City being flooded in the subways. They had trenches underneath the earth, and we would fight for two or three or four blocks, <coughs> stop there and wait. The next morning, the Germans would be behind us. It took us several days <coughs> to know how in the world did they ever get behind us? So we went down the sewers, went through the sewers, and came up the other side. And they had to turn around. And we just got this part. Now we got three more blocks that we just won, and we got to fight back to win. Those are the kinds of things that do happen. Nobody knew, nobody told us they had big gutters down underneath there. We had to find it out ourselves. But I'm glad we did. We went on further to Schweinfurt. And you can look these on the map if you're really interested in some of these things. Schweinfurt was the most heavily fortified city with any aircraft guns in Germany. Not only did they have their whole city surrounded by any aircraft guns, but they also produced them. And so after we left Schweinfurt, it took four, five, six days, we went to Nuremberg, and Nuremberg is where the trials were held. They gave up pretty easily. They gave up pretty easily. It was a beautiful city. They didn't really want to be bombed. We could lie there at night and watch the planes go over and drop tons and tons and tons of bombs on some of the city. But Nuremberg said, no, we're going we're gonna to give it up. We don't want our city destroyed. Sure, it was hit by some bombs, but not like some of the other cities. I have always said, and I would hope it never would happen, that when somebody talks about World War II and the devastation, many, many American people do not understand or know what war really is about unless you have experienced it. When I've gone around and talked to young people, I had one young lad and I said, how many have mothers and fathers and the kids put their hands up and that's fine. I said, great, they're serving their country. I said, how many of you have ever experienced war? A little kid about your size put his hand up. And I said, where did you experience it? Bosnia? We get a lot of immigrants in Lakewood, and he and his family survived the terrific war there. And he really knew what war was about. And it wasn't until, unfortunately, 9-11 that many Americans realized what war could be like when all the people were killed with, with the airplanes. 
before we <coughs> before we got to Nür Nuremberg, we had R and R. R and R in the army is rest and relaxation. And what that does, it gives the frontline troops two or three days in the rear so that they can be refortified by someone who's had R and R for two or three days. So we had R and R this day. We had bagpipes with the 42nd Infantry and they would play the bagpipes. Oh boy, I got everybody shaking them right and going to all kinds of things. Wonderful music from bagpipes. The postmaster came. A postmaster in war delivering mail? Of course, why not? The soldiers wanted letters. Well, Dick didn't receive a letter. It was a box about this high. <coughs> I have to tell you about the box before. For our birthdays, my mother used to make German chocolate cake for us. In April was my birthday. I opened the box, and what do you think was in there? My birthday cake. <laughs> A little green on the outside and around because it had been shipped in January. <laughs> But it was good. Oh, was it good? <laughs> it was homemade. It was homemade. Then as we proceeded south, people say, well, you must have known about this. But I can stand here and tell you I didn't know anything about it. And any book you read where someone is being honest about it, they didn't know anything about it. Now maybe, President Eisenhower, or General Eisenhower at the time, General, you know who, Patton, at the time, he knew everything. Alexander, a few others. Maybe they knew there was something amiss. Or maybe the Russians told the American people that there are certain kinds of things out there that are not very pleasant. As we walked toward Munich, which is the birthplace of Nazism. That's where it started. Our goal was to capture Nurm, uh, Munich. We crossed a couple rivers, got going, locking down a little bit more, and we walked a long way. The 42nd Infantry that I started with walked 400 miles through the war. Now, occasionally, Occasionally, they would give us a ride on a tank. And my little experience with that tank was, they said, get on the top of the tank, get on the side of the tank, and we'll roll out in. Well, we rolled out in this nice open field. And the Germans saw them, too. And they started to blasting the devil out of them. Pretty soon, we heard, brr, brr. They're starting up these tanks. Guy gets out of his cockpit and says, Get off the tanks, guys, we're leaving. <laughs> and that's true. This is what happened. We got off the tanks. The tanks mowed out away of the artillery fire, and they left us right in the middle of the bombardment. Fortunately, we got back to our billet place where we could fight with some protection, because you didn't have any protection out there then. So a lot of little funny things like that happen. Little different things that people maybe kept to themselves. But as we walked further south, and it was now midnight, we kept walking and walking and thought, my golly, when are they going to stop walking? We've been walking since 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Somebody started to smell something. What is that smell? Nobody could understand what that smell was. It was horrific, terrible, terrible. So, if we want to start with this, we finally, the 42nd Infantry, the 45th Infantry, and the 20th Armored Division were all headed in the same direction. They all smelled the same thing. What they saw was Dachau, although we didn't know the name at the time. 
But Dachau was the first concentration camp built by Adolf Hitler in Germany. 1938. People who were like my son, who had to walk with a cane or something, were incarcerated there. People who didn't like the Nazi philosophy were incarcerated there. People who were different were incarcerated. Germans, Austrians, from the Netherlands, any place they could find them, they, as long as they didn't follow the rules and regulations, that was it. But before that, I taught with a teacher who was Jewish in Lakewood, whose mother and father left Germany. Her dad was in Dachau, and if they could get out of the country with a little bit of money, I suspect, they were released and they came to England. But some people who didn't have the money who were in for different things, were staying there. And it got worse and worse and worse. Now, if you think Dachau was the only concentration camp in Germany, that's not true. There were hundreds of them. The friend that I talked with on occasion was 15 when he was in Auschwitz. Now, they're the big names, you understand. You know, Belsen, Dachau, um, help me, somebody begins with an A. Hmm? Thank you, Auschwitz, thank you. But those are the ones that are prominent. Those are the ones that are prominent. But there were hundreds of little ones around. And what they were doing was pushing all these people toward, toward, Dachau, because that was the last one. It was the first one built. It's going to be the last one taken. Well, finally we got there, and there were 32,000 prisoners at that camp. Enough to, the capacity was probably maybe 4,000. So you can understand the conditions that these people had to live under. We knew, or thought we knew, that there were some Americans in there, and there had been some American soldiers who were captured that were put in Dachau, but we could find no trace. But anyway, the three units, the 42nd, the 45th, and the 20th Armored, hit about the same time. And if you read about the 45th, the 45th is infamous in saying, we, we did it. And we just kind of say, okay, if you say we did it, that's fine. Show us the flag that was given to our general <laughs> to surrender. <laughs> and that's all we say. We don't, you know, who cares who really did it? But I think we have the proof that the 42nd did it. I met up with a very interesting person from Belgium who was in Dachau. He and I became very friendly. He would take me to certain places and say, you cannot go in there, but I'll open the door. I know I would never go in there, but even opening the door tore me apart. People with skin just on their bones. No flesh underneath. Eyes as if they would never close them again. Or if they did, they would never open them again. The typhus fever was so strong at that camp that he said, you cannot go in there because you may catch it very quickly. Because hundreds of those prisoners that we released never made it out. They died before they got anything. We were not permitted to give them any food because some of them had gotten food, but in the, because they had never eaten much before, they died from just ingesting 
good food. And so you do not give any of the prisoners food. Well, what are we going to do with these 32,000? We have to bring them back in, get them all ready for the medics who are going to come in and do the work. Because we were an infantry outfit. They were the ones who had the medicinal knowledge. Here there are 32,000. They look fairly healthy. These were the last ones in. I'll show you some pictures of those who were on their way in and never made it. These pictures are original pictures taken by one of our persons in a brownie. Now, you don't even understand brownie. And I don't understand your the way you get pictures on your thing. <laughs> but some of you may understand what a brownie was. Must have been a tremendous little instrument because these are over 60 some years old and they still have their color. I have preserved them somewhat. Okay. The gates. I stood guard at the gate. It was always nice to say, oh, you're a four-star general. You can't get in, can you? Because <laughs> we were told nobody could come in until they were released by the upper high command, which would be General Eisenhower. So we kept everybody out. Finally, they let a few photographers in. Finally, they let a few writers in. And finally, they lose some brass. We used to call them brass because we didn't have, we only had PFC stripes or sergeant stripes. Can you see that? Okay. Next one, please. This is what the people who looked like mostly who were not out at that front gate or waiting to get out. The electrified fences they had, those who were so ill that they wanted to help their own people out, threw themselves onto the electrified fence to short it out. And then somebody came and cut them out, and they had a hole that they were going out through. So we had to stop them from going through it, out through that hole, even though the electrified fence had been disengaged. Okay. Looking over some dead SS troops. You know, the SS troops were the meanest, nastiest individuals, and there may have been some nice ones somewhere along the line, but. Once they had tattooed on their underarm, SS, they were the enemy, more than the regular army guy, because they were the ones who were doing most of this tr terrible tragedy to the people. I am in the middle. I am in the middle. I didn't know they were taking a picture. I must have let that photographer in. I don't know. I <laughs> to my right, as you're looking at it, it would be to your left, but to my right was my lieutenant, and to my left was the Belgian prisoner who was my friend. He spoke perfect English, and we got along very well, because I could not speak Belgian. Another picture. And I don't know how I got into all these pictures. I'm not, you know, a picture. picture. There I am again with a rifle on my shoulder on the far side pulling an SS troop out of the moat. Because in the, in the, uh, the trajectory of the camp, they had electrified fences, a moat, another electrified fence, and then they had machine guns up on top and down on the bottom underneath the ground so that no one could escape. If they tried to, they really never made it. My sergeant is in the middle, and the Belgium is on the side. This picture, by the way, and I didn't know it until 1992, was taken by a PD plane dealer photographer. Because I woke up one day, and I looked open the paper, and there's that picture. And I said to my wife, who was living at the time, Millie! I, my picture's in the paper. She said, what do you get your picture in the paper for? I said, I don't know, but there it is. <laughs> but there it is. Okay. This is the camp, as you're looking 
down onto it. You can see where the electrified fences are. There and there. Here's the moat back here. Here's the high wall. There's the machine gun. This is where they brought the people in from the outside into the open gates. <coughs> These are the ones who never made it. They were bringing these people in by cattle car. And before they were allowed to get out and into the camp, the German SS machine gunned them. They never got out of it. Maybe they were the lucky ones. Who knows? I don't know. Another one? Side door view. You can see the, the bodies stacked in there. Why do you keep this thing in your mind? It just will never, never leave. A third shot. Okay. When they try to get rid of the bodies, these are the crematoriums. Crematorium is where they put the bodies in, burned them, collected the ashes, and threw another two in, and so forth. Off and on, off and on. I saw barrels this big around and this high, full of ashes. Shoes, teeth, those don't burn. Jewelry. You often wonder what these people were thinking. They had to be somewhat imbalanced. That's one of the guards that didn't get away. And one of the things you notice, if you would, there are no shoes on this German soldier. It's a disgrace in German artillery or whatever to die with your boots on. And they took their boots off and shot them. Some of the prisoners tore some of their guards apart alive. Because they had dressed themselves into the uniform of the prisoner, thinking that no one would notice them. But who would notice them more than anybody? The prisoners. We didn't know what they were. We could have just said, well, they, yeah, there are some more prisoners. Okay. This is what Dachau looks like today. This is what Dachau looks like today. They took all but one of the barracks down and planted a tree in front of every barrack that was there. So there are 24 trees plus the big one in the back, which they didn't take down. 25 years, I never said anything about this. Not even to my wife. Until I found out that people said it didn't exist. Until I found out that some teacher in some schools was saying, we're talking about the Holocaust. Do you know anything about it? Well, I think I know something about it. I don't know everything about it, but I know the end result of it. I didn't talk to my children. This is my youngest son. You'll see him in a few moments. Because he, I took them back to where dad fought. My daughter was 12. My other son was 11. And he was 8. Remember when you were 8, John? <laughs> but anyway, and I've lost my trend. You want to just turn one so I can... There he is! <laughs> With his red hair. But anyway, they saw it. And at that particular time, 25 years later, they would not let my children into the museum. I don't know what they've done now, but because it's been another 30 years or so, 35 years maybe. But if you ever get a chance, you should visit, if you ever get to Washington, the Holocaust Museum there. There's one on the east side, a great one on the east side. I do a lot of talking to the Jewish 
community. They had loved ones who were the end result of some of this. The end result. And this, are, this was a postcard. You, when you go somewhere, you always have a postcard. Well, these are the, this is the actual icon of Dachau with the jangled bodies. You can see the arms and the legs and the head, and that's how they portray it. This is the replica of the fence and the guards. This is what the bungs look like. And they had three, they have three uh, memorials, Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant memorials there. This is at, this is at that house. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them, if I can. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? How did the veterans of D-Day treat the replacements? How did the veterans of D-Day uh, treat the replacements with open arms? With open arms. Because they were depleted to the point where, you know, you have a, a company, you have a squad, you, you have like seven or eight in a squad. If you lost five of them, you don't have many left. And the, and the battalions are like 250. If you lose better than half of them, you don't have many left. They really treated us very well. Well, they played some tricks on us, you know, like veteran people would, but uh, we all, we became veterans then because we lost people when I was a replacement. I could see one very vivid thing with one person being completely obliterated by a Bouncing Betty. They don't call them Bouncing Betty, they call them IDs now, I guess. But they'd had Bouncing Bettys during World War II. It would jump up about this high and then explode. So yes, we lost some replacements too. I have a question here, I think. Someone? Oh, I was gonna, yeah. I, I, I heard about the Bouncing Bettys. Oh, have you heard about it? Yeah. That's right. And they, and, one of the clever things the Germans did, they were clever. We were going up the hill this way. Which way would you think they ought to have the strings where you trip a Bonson Betty? This way. No, they did them this way. Because when you walked up this way, you only went over here and then you hit it. If you'd had them this way, then we would have walked right over the top of them like this. But nobody knew they were on the other side. I mean, they, they were smart people, too. They had some smart generals and people. Yes, please. You said you were there at, after the end of the war. How did the people treat you, the, you know, the Germans or the Austrians? How did they treat the um, Americans? With respect, with respect, we practically took over their, we built it in their places. So we just kind of said, well, you're going to have to find someplace else to live. Did you find much remorse on their part, or did they really not understand? They always, do, they always, many of them said we never knew it happened. Mm -hmm. And they must not have had any nostril. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. Have you ever been to a slaughterhouse? I've been to the one in Chicago and almost knocked me down. I used to have one I understand before I moved to Cleveland, not on 55th Street. But that's exactly what it smelled like. And I don't know how you could live that close to something like that, because we were 5, 10, 12 miles away when we noticed the first smell. I mean, dead flesh, burning smells. I, I don't mean to be as vivid, but it, sometimes it just gets in me. So if I'm getting too much, just say, hey, settle down there. <laughs> Another question. Yes, sir. In any of your speeches, do you... Does anybody, do you find that there are Holocaust deniers? Oh, I'll show you a few letters. Chastising me for spreading this rumor. I have letters, I kept them. Yes, to answer your question. Yes. Yes, please. I'm sorry. Did you ever see any of the orchestras, the people who were playing, the, the 
I, n I couldn't, well, you know, we were there, we were only there five days. I was not there as a medic. I was there, first of all, just to get it, and try to get some strength around to get people doing this and doing that. And then we packed up and headed toward Austria. Then the war ended May 6th. So we were here April 29th, and then we only had five, six days to get to Austria. Any other question? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I was looking at this young guy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I apologize. Is there any difference between your 25 years of silence and then when you chose to open up? Is there a difference in your home and in your personal life? Yeah, I think it relieved me a lot. My wife used to tell me, she said, wake up, Dick, wake up. For crying out loud, you're going to kill me. And I, what may I do? After I started getting it out of my soul, I didn't do it anymore. So maybe that was a release. I can't prove that, but she used to tell me. I say, Millie, I'm not going to hurt you. <laughs> but those things do happen. They're not made up, you know, and people say, oh, they, you know, what about this? No, they're not made up. I'm sorry? Some do. My brother, who was in the South Pacific, did not. And I respected him for it because I read about the Japanese. And we think the Germans were cruel. They were terrible. And he never opened his mouth. Not to his mom or his dad or to his brothers. And we never pressed him for it. Yes, sir. My great-great-grandpa was in the South Pacific and he got captured by one of the Japanese and he, it wasn't very good. I'm sure it was not, son. I'm sure. I'm sure it was not. Well, the Japanese, their philosophy was, if I get killed, I'm going to be where I'm supposed to be anyway. So I don't care how I kill somebody or where I kill somebody, as long as I, even if I'm killed, I'm okay. Okay? Does anyone want to ex say something about their experience that they had, sir? You did, sir? Any combat experience of any kind? You know what my favorite, favorite badge is? And this may be nasty to say, but it's not only a favorite badge. It's the Combat Infantryman's Badge. What separates us from those poor guys who were in the tanks, they don't get that. And he did as much as we did, but I really love that badge. Because <laughs> that only tells you. That an infantryman can have the badge without the wreath. Only the combat infantryman can have the wreath. And I'm proud of it. Yes, ma'am. Right. So if the camp was empty, how long did it take? To oh, for this? Yeah. <laughs> well, some of them were sent back to their homes, if they had homes to be sent to. Uh, others were put into groups, and people, you know, do like they do here when you don't have somebody hand handling you, helping you. Um, some of these people were only captured about a month, maybe before the end of the war, and they looked fairly healthy. The other ones, they either died or they were put into hospitals. How and did I, it take to process? Uh, the processing took probably, I, I would say almost six to seven months. Because they had to find out who they were. You know, they, they were tattooed. And um, they had a number on their arm, and you could tell. The Germans were very methodical about that. They wanted everything done that way, and so they could keep records. Well, the records backfired on them because they had all these things on sheets of paper. Anything else? You are a wonderful audience. And young ones, shake the hand of your grandpa or your grandma. Give them a big hug. <laughs> He's not your grandpa. <laughs> Thank you.